The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 47, to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together, the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Esther 4, 1 through 17, this is entitled, Unseen and Unacknowledged. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in the front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for the destruction which was given at Shushan that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. One of the sub-disciplines of systematic theology is known as theology proper. This deals specifically with the being, attributes, and works of God. In the Trinitarian model, which true Christians hold to, this study includes pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit, and Christology, which is the study of Jesus Christ. Concerning God, it is said that no one can see God. God is spirit. However, though God is unseen, we also know that God is omnipresent. It's rather hard to imagine that God is everywhere, and yet we cannot see him. But the two are not contradictory at all. 
as God is spirit, then he can be everywhere at all times and still be unseen. He is of a completely different nature than we are. And yet, though he is unseen, his effects are not in creation, we can see and experience all the things that God has created out of nothing. They are the evidence that God is. But evidences of God are not limited to the physical things that we can see. They are also realized in how things come out. The process may be unseen, but the results are not. If we just pay attention to times and to circumstances, we can, in fact, see the evidences of God in those things. Israel is a perfect example of this. By all logical processes of thought, they should not even exist anymore. But not only do they exist, they exist exactly as Scripture said they would. As a people, with the language they speak, in the times that things happen to them, in the places they happen, and in the results of where they are in connection to their surroundings. All of these things show us evidences of God being worked out in our world. We can ascribe to these things time and chance, or we can take them as God intended for us to take them and see that he is there doing what he is doing for our benefit and hopefully for our choosing to seek him out. This is what faith is. This is what is pleasing to God. As far as God being unseen, this is how James describes him in our text verse for today from James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. The word James uses for variation is the word paralegi. It is a word unique in all of Scripture. James reached into the world of the scientific realm to attempt to reveal to us what God is like. The word indicates a parallax. A parallax is where an object appears to differ when viewed from different positions. It can be through the viewfinder on a camera, or it can be where you stand looking at a star from different points on the Earth's orbit. But if you look at a star from even one millionth of an inch different than another spot, there will be a change, no matter how small it may appear. Nothing can be truly viewed in the same manner except in the exact same spot. However, God can be spiritually viewed from anywhere, at any time, by any set of eyes, and he will never be different. If we could all look at an atom right in the middle of this room, we would all see the atom, and yet we would all be seeing the atom from a different perspective. But when we look to God, we look to that which is completely unchanging. Why is this important to know? Because God may be hidden from our eyes, but he is there. And he is without any change at all. When he speaks, it is a reflection of who he is. And thus his word is. We cannot find anything other than the unchanging God in his word. And why is this important to know? Because his word before the book of Esther is confirmed in the book of Esther. And Esther deals with Israel of the past. But God is still dealing with Israel of the present in the same manner. Well, Unless you're a Reformed theologian, a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, or one of many other groups, then he is supposedly dealing with them differently, and you are sitting in the wrong church. <laughs> and why is this important to know? Because the Lord is missing in Esther, and yet his presence is seen nonetheless. The question is, are you looking for the Lord where he is not to be seen? You should be. But at the same time, you need to not insert the Lord where he is not acknowledged. Now, what does that mean? Keep listening and we'll get to that. The Lord is there. Just remember that for now. He is there. And he is tending to his word in chapter 4 of Esther. It's all to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again. And may God speak to us through his word today. And may his glorious name ever be praised. I have just a couple of thoughts for you today. The first is a time to mourn. It's verses 1 through 9. Verse 1, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes. The words here take us back to the events of chapter 3. Haman had plotted against the Jews, and King Ahasuerus had agreed to his scheme. A date for the destruction of the Jews was chosen, a decree was published, and the kingdom was made aware of what the decree contained. 
In learning of this and of the behind the scenes details, as we will see in verse 4 7, Mordecai then takes several very Middle Eastern and more specifically very Jewish actions. In them, he identified himself openly and publicly as a Jew. He is said first to have torn his clothes. This is a sign of great distress. A person's clothes are their outer protection. They are a covering of one's nakedness. They serve as an adornment, and so on. In tearing one's clothes, it is a rejection of each of these things in some measure. One's vulnerability is revealed, one's nakedness is exposed, and the adornment that was delighted in is rejected. The first time that this was seen in Scripture was when Reuben found that Joseph was no longer in the pit that he and his brothers had cast him into. From there, this sign of great distress is seen again and again and again throughout the Bible. Next, verse 1 continues, and put on sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth and ashes as an external adornment signifies extreme mourning. Instead of one's regular clothes, one would put on this coarse material which is made from hair and which was used for making sacks. The poor quality of the cloth would be itchy and it would be unsightly. The garments would be both a physical reminder to the body and to the eyes of great mourning. It speaks of a state of humility, not arrogance before God and man. Ashes add in a second element to the state of mourning. Sitting in or wearing ashes implies that being reduced to ashes is one's just due. It is, in essence, a petition for mercy. I understand that I deserve the fiery judgment of God, and I acknowledge that. Thine will be done. These external actions of Mordecai are the greatest acts of humility that he could perform, and from there, verse 1 continues, then went out into the midst of the city. One can sit in ashes as the king of Nineveh did in Jonah. One can roll in ashes as is noted in Jeremiah 6 verse 26. Or one can lay in them as will be seen in the next verse here in Esther. In Mordecai's case, he put on sackcloth and ashes and then he went out into the midst of the city. This was to make his state known to all. Being covered in this way, it would be a sign to all that great distress filled his soul. And from there, others would hear... And follow suit as, verse 1 continues, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. The words here are exceedingly similar to those found in Genesis 27, verse 34. After Jacob stole Esau's blessing through deception, Esau went into his father to obtain the blessing he was promised. However, when it was discovered what had happened, we read, When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me! Me also, oh my father. There is only a very small change in the words between there and here, from the word za'ak to the word tsa'ak. The verses are essentially identical. The only difference is the use of the letter za'in in the place of a tsadi. The symbolism then should not be missed. Esau was a hairy man who cried out in distress. Mordecai is covered in a hairy garment, crying out in distress. Esau, Picturing Adam had lost his blessing, Mordecai takes on the same picture, representative of Israel, having lost their blessing, now facing a curse. What is obvious, however, is what is missing from this external display of mourning. Garments are torn, sackcloth and ashes are put on, and there is great wailing, all external signs, but there is no note of an internal turning to God through prayer and supplication. When priests and prophets such as Daniel, Ezekiel, and Ezra face such trials, they are shown to have revealed their anguish both externally and through prayer and supplication. Whether Mordecai prayed or not, the Bible specifically maintains silence on this issue. Only the externals are noted here. The Greek translation of the Old Testament adds at the end of this verse the words aritai ethnos medan edekikas. A people are going to be destroyed who have done no evil. The additions to the Greek translation, of which there are others, do not appear to reflect the intent of the original at all. In fact, they harm the integrity of what the story is actually conveying. If Israel had done no evil, they would not have been sent into exile. Verse 2, he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. The words reveal that a law must have existed which precluded anyone in mourning from entering near the king. 
This can also be inferred from Nehemiah's words. He was sad in the presence of the king, and when the king asked about it, it says that Nehemiah became dreadfully afraid. From these verses, it can be deduced that no mourning was to be displayed before Persian kings. Understanding this, we can see that Mordecai could not enter or even sit in the king's gate. Instead, he only went to the front of it. This would be as near as he could get in hopes of contacting Esther and relaying to her his message and his hopes. Verse 3, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. As the decree arrived and was posted throughout the provinces, the Jews followed the same pattern as Mordecai. They mourned, fasted, wept, and lamented, employing the same traditional signs of mourning. Here, a new word is introduced, yatsa, which means to lay or to spread. It will be seen only four times. It gives the sense of spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed to lie in. Still, there is no sign of praying to or petitioning of God in any of these words. The Lord is not mentioned at all. The words are purposeful. He may be there behind the scenes, but the word shows that it is self and not God who is the focus of the narrative. This verse now introduces two sets of twos. First, there is fasting noted here, and then it will be seen again in verse 16 of this same chapter. This is voluntary, but in distress. It is throughout the Jewish people, and it is in response to the king's troubling decree. The next will be mandated, but in hope. It is in Shushan alone, and it is at the queen's command, and for the queen's sake. Together they contrast, and yet they confirm fasting as a source of national identification of the Jews through this ancient rite. The second set of twos concerns the attitude of the Jews after the giving of the edict. In this one, there is great mourning, there is fasting, there is weeping and wailing, and many laying in sackcloth and ashes. In chapter 8, after the next edict, there will be joy, gladness, honor, a feast, and a holiday. The two contrast, yes, but they also confirm the unity of the people in both distress and in exultation. Verse 4, so Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. It was already known to the royal court, as was seen in verse 211, that Mordecai had cared for Esther. It may be that all knew that he raised her after her parents died, but didn't realize that she was related to him by blood. Or those who attended to her may have known this, though it wasn't widely disseminated yet. No matter what, though, they knew of the relationship between the two, and when they saw Mordecai's distress, they passed this on to her. When she saw this, it says that she was deeply distressed. The Hebrew word is in a passive, intensive form, showing that this was really troubling her immensely. It can be assumed, then, that Mordecai was an otherwise upbeat, amiable guy. But something had destroyed his normal demeanor. His misery now becomes hers. Verse 4 continues, then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. The reason for doing this is so that he would be then allowed into the gate. Once there, she could meet him and find out what the problem was. But even this heartfelt invitation was rejected. This would then demonstrate to her the immense grief that he was facing, so much so that he was unwilling to take off his mourning clothes to let her know what had come about. Verse 5, then Esther called Hadak, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. It is said that one of the king's personal eunuchs would be assigned to the queen. He would normally be an older man of the highest reputation and who had faithfully served. As her personal attendant, he would be the most logical choice to speak to Mordecai. He would be faithful to find out and faithful to repeat exactingly what he had learned. I tried desperately to figure out the name of Hatak. I thought I had it. I did not. And so I'm not going to include the meaning of his name. It's of Persian origin. There's really nothing to substantiate any of the guesses concerning his name. Verse 6, so Hatak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. If your translation says street instead of city square, do not panic. The word rechov can mean either. It comes from a verb which means to widen. Thus, Mordecai is in a broad place before the king's gate. It would be a place where many people passed, and so he is there making his mourning public. 
It is to this place that Hathak comes to find him. Verse 7, And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him. This is Mordecai's way of showing that what occurred to all of the Jews was a decision based solely on the actions of one Jew. All that happened to him then is referring to verses 3-1 through 3-6, where Mordecai refused to rise for Haman, which culminated in the words, But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. That was verse 3-6. To support this, he then tells what more he learned of the matter with the words, verse 7 continues, and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. In passing this information on, it was intended to show how great was Haman's resentment at Mordecai's actions and the eagerness that then resulted in destroying all of the Jews. In other words, it is to demonstrate that Haman was not just a narcissist, but that he was truly mentally unbalanced. If he were merely a narcissist, he would have had Mordecai alone punished, probably in a public and disgraceful way. But what has arisen shows the actions of a madman. As a side note, the word translated as some here is the word parasha. It will be used only here and in Esther 10 verse 2 in the entire Bible. It signifies an exact amount or a portion. Nowadays, it refers to a section of a biblical book something like our chapter divisions in the Bible. The parasha forms the basis for reading of scripture in Jewish synagogues even to this day. Verse 8, he also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan. A written copy, or at least a written note, with the substance of the decree would validate his words. It would show the timing of the events to come, and it would convey to her that Haman's plan wasn't just a hopeful wish, but a now issued decree which bore the king's approval. Verse 8 continues that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. It has been noted that the Hebrew of these words is exceedingly strong. There is an urgency in accomplishing the task. And so whether Mordecai is either commanding her as his adopted daughter or charging her as a member of the Jewish people, he is now asking her to reveal her nationality to the king. She is of the same people as those who are set for destruction, and so her petition to the king is to be based on that premise. The Greek translation of this verse adds in the following long sentence, which is not supported by any other text, nor is it supported by the tenor of the book of Esther as well. But I'm reading it to you for a reason. It's because whoever did the Greek translation added this in to show that they were relying on the Lord. That is not the case at all. Here's what it says. Remember the time of your low estate. This is Mordecai speaking to Esther uh, supposedly, and in what manner you have been nourished and carried in my arms, and that Haman, who is next to the king, has got a decree for our destruction. Pray therefore to the Lord and plead with the king that we may be delivered from death. The theme of Esther is that of the Lord being unacknowledged by the people and yet still working in the background for them. The addition of these words in the Greek translation is surely a later fabrication. Verse 9, so Hattak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Now Esther has an understanding of the basis for Mordecai's lamentation, and she has all of the background information as well. It would be sufficient for her to grasp the magnitude of the situation and to act in accord with Mordecai's pleas. However, instead of doing as charged, she follows another path. Woe to us, for we have been sold to destruction. Our hope is gone, and we have met our end. The empire will complete the king's instruction. Death to our people, the royal decree does send. Our hope is lost, our life is dried up. There is nothing but sadness till we meet our end. No water for our lips, no wine in our cup. Death to our people, the royal decree does send. If there is hope, from where will it come? It feels as if we as a people have finally met our end. If there is hope, we need only a crumb, or death is assured, since the royal decree is penned. Our second thought today is a time such as this. It's verses 10 through 17. Verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. The word command here is for Hathak to transfer her words to Mordecai, not for him to transfer a command to him. As far as Hathak, 
He entered the narrative in verse 5. Now he is mentioned here for the very last time in the Bible. So long, Hatak. Verse 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. A law already in place and fully known to all people was that no person could ever enter into the inner court where the king sat without being called. This could be in response to a request, approving it and allowing entrance, or it could be from the throne commanding someone to be brought in. Either way, the approval had to come from the throne. Anyone who entered without approval was given one law, one law, death. However, the king could hold out his scepter to the condemned person, granting pardon for the illegal intrusion. Two words found in this verse are unique to the book of Esther, yashat, or hold out, and sharbit, or scepter. They will be used in three verses of Esther and found nowhere else in scripture. Verse 11 continues, yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. Even the queen fell under the law of entry, and she had not been summoned for a full month. She, therefore, may have felt that the king was no longer interested in her. Remember the second gathering of the virgins? She might be thinking, well, he's found somebody else. If she petitioned to the king to enter, he may deny her request. If this was the case, then she could not under any circumstance come forward and expect to live. However, if she petitioned him to enter and he approved, then she would be compelled to explain herself immediately even if Haman was present. Either way, going forward based on a request would possibly be ineffective in resolving the matter. But going in without being requested would potentially be suicidal. The amount of time that had gone by made this, to her at least, a definite possibility. However, the number 30 in Scripture, according to E.W. Bullinger, signifies, in a higher degree, the perfection of divine order as marking the right moment. Rather than being an inopportune time, it is the perfect time to begin a process to bring about a change in the direction of events. Verse 12, so they told Mordecai Esther's words, and they told to Mordecai words, Esther. The only logical question for me, and which I now ask of you, something I asked of Sergio a couple of months ago, maybe two months ago when I typed this, he said, what do you mean? I said, Who are they? Hatak is the only person who has been mentioned and spoken to since verse 5. In verse 10, Esther spoke to him again to give a command for Mordecai. The Hebrew is in the third person masculine plural. Hatak disappears from the narrative and in comes a plural (laughs) verb. And Sergio's answer? I never noticed that before. I've read this a million times. He's heard it his whole life. He's a Jew. They read it every year per him. He said, I never noticed that. Whoever they are... They passed on her words to Mordecai, verse 13, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. There is no them in this verse that is inserted by the translators. It simply says, then said Mordecai to answer unto Esther. It makes the they in the previous verse that much more perplexing. Despite this puzzling linguistic difficulty, Mordecai's words are somber indeed. It may be that he suspected Haman knew Esther's nationality. Whether this is the case or not, the servants, including Hathak, now did. With her identity known, it could not be withheld from the king's knowledge without jeopardizing their own lives. If they held that back and they said, well, I knew she was a Jew, and then he had her executed, they would be executed also. Therefore, she would not escape even being in the king's palace and even being the queen. She was a Jewess, and her position could no longer protect her. Verse 14, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Almost every scholar who comments on these words attributes the words of Mordecai to a strong faith in the belief that God will personally interpose and ensure that things will come out right. I'm sorry, this is entirely incorrect. If he believed this, he would have said it or the author would have stated it for him. But both God and the Lord are completely left out of the book, highlighting the fact that he is not on their minds at all. A knowledge of God's presence cannot be assumed or inserted into this narrative. 
It can only be assumed by the reader of the narrative. It is the reader's job to see that God, despite being rejected by the Jews, has not rejected them. This takes us back to Leviticus 26, where the Lord stated these words. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, which they are right now, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. It is for the sake of the covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the Lord made this statement. Though the people are dispersed because of their rejection of him, including remaining in dispersion voluntarily, he is working to preserve the Jews according to his word to the patriarchs. Whether Mordecai even knew of this promise at all or not cannot be determined. But as a Jew, he knew that his people would find deliverance in some way. This is the same thought as the secular Jews to this very day. They are sure that they will stand as a people. It is practically a national motto, but they do not attribute this to God. Rather, they attribute it to their own ability to preserve their heritage and culture. It is not the Lord, but their Jewishness, which continues to drive their overall ideology as a people today. In the words of this clause are two very rare words. The first, revach, is translated as relief. It was seen in Genesis 32, verse 16, translated as a distance. With the distance, one has an interval and thus respite or relief. It carries the idea of a breathing space. There in Genesis, it was used as a picture of an interval between the dispensations of time in redemptive history. I would argue that it does the same thing again here in this book. Now it is seen for the second and last time. The second word is found only here in the Bible, Hatzalah, or deliverance. Mordecai is trusting in deliverance, but he is not trusting in the deliverer. Time and chance alone are on his mind. Verse 14 continues, but you and your father's house will perish. The words here strongly suggest that Mordecai was certain Haman knew of the Jewish ancestry of Esther, or at least the Esther's ancestry previously revealed to Hathak and others would be her demise. She would not escape, and her father's house, meaning his line, would perish with her. Verse 14 continues, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Again, these words cannot be attributed to the workings of the Lord. They are words of time, chance, luck, and fortune. If Mordecai accepted the Lord's divine hand of Jewish protection, he would have stated it clearly and unambiguously, just as King David did numerous times in his life, such as in the 18th Psalm. Here's what David said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. David knew the Lord, he loved the Lord, he trusted the Lord, and he called out to the Lord. This is left entirely out of the words of Mordecai. As words reflect the man, so Mordecai trusted, but not in the Lord. And yet, the Lord included this book in his word to demonstrate that he, while being neglected by the people, remained faithful to them. When the world looks at Israel today, and while the Jews of today continue to trust in their own might and prowess, the Lord sits unchanged in his being, and thus unchanged in his promise to the patriarchs. Israel will stand because of the word of the Lord and because of that alone. Despite the attitude presented, the words of this clause are as hopeful as any found in Scripture. They are memorable simply for the truth that they reveal. Umi yodea im le'ekazot higa'at la malkut. And who knows whether for a time as this you have come to the kingdom. Marvelous words. Mordecai sees an opportunity and he sees that it is about as good as any could ever get. Esther may die coming before the king or she may be the means by which they are saved, but the opportunity outweighs the risk on all levels. As John Gill states it, it is better to perish in a good cause than in a bad one. Verse 15, then Esther told them 
to reply to Mordecai. Again, them is inserted here. It simply says, and said Esther, return unto Mordecai. Who them is goes unstated. But them folks, whoever them might be, sure make a great mystery. Verse 16, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Esther's reply of verse 16 is one of resigned submission. Her words are first for the Jews of Shushan to hold a fast. However, unlike many other fasts in the Bible, this one says nothing about it being to the Lord or to God. On other occasions, when fasting is noted, the same verse itself or the context of the verse often includes God as the object of the fast. This is seen, for example, in Ezra 8, verse 23, where it says, So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayers. Here the object is Esther, fast for me. Again, scholars force God into this verse, stating that he is the object of the petition and that he is the one for whom the fast is made. This cannot be assumed. In Zechariah chapter 7, we read this, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? In other words, they were holding fasts while they were in exile, and it wasn't to the Lord, and the Lord knew it. In the same context is what we see here in the book of Esther. When Jesus spoke to the leaders of Israel in Matthew chapter 6, he corrected them on misdirected fasting as well. People all over the world fast for a multitude of reasons, and few of them are directed at petitioning God. It very well may be that his divine intervention is what they are seeking, but the author the author of Esther does not indicate it, and the words of Esther do not either. The words leave out the Lord entirely. We cannot place him there after the fact. Verse 16 continues, Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. The words here are helpful to understanding what the term three days, night or day means. Jesus uses similar terminology in Matthew 12 concerning his time in the grave. And yet the timeline for his crucifixion and resurrection is a total of three days, from Friday to Sunday. This is later confirmed 13 times in the New Testament when it says that he rose on the third day. Such is the case here as well. In Esther 5, verse 1, we will read the words, Vehi beyom hashelishi. Now it happened on the third day. Thus the time frame here and in Matthew means three days up to the third day. Verse 16 continues, My maids and I will fast likewise. These words show that the fast was one for Esther, not to the Lord. Her maids are not Jewish. If they were, it would indicate this. Instead, she is asking for a fast as a sign of solidarity with her people and among those she is in charge of. This is similar to what Jephthah's daughter asked for prior to her death. Here's what it says. Then she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. These words here close out the set of twos concerning two fasts being held that we just did a couple minutes ago. The first was voluntary but in distress. It was throughout the Jewish people and it was in response to the king's troubling decree. This one is mandated, but in hope. It is in Shushan alone, and it is at the queen's command and for the queen's sake. Together they contrast, and yet they confirm fasting as a source of national identification. Verse 16 continues, And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. After the sign of solidarity and identification is complete, Esther will be encouraged enough to enter the king's presence without first asking or being requested and without first being approved. It may mean her death, but it is the only logical way to conduct what needs to be done. Verse 16 continues, and if I perish, I perish. Her words are not words of faith. When faced with the fiery furnace, Daniel's three friends did acknowledge that they might die, but before doing so, they acknowledge in faith, 
that the Lord would deliver them. Here's what they said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. The story of Esther is about the Lord, but it is not about the Lord being the object in adoration of the people. It is about the Lord being faithful to a people who have failed to acknowledge him. They are to be saved despite themselves. They were given the chance to return to him, and they did not. They remained in exile. But by not acknowledging him in their words and actions in Esther 4, they are profaning him. There can be no other way at looking at this without abusing what is presented. Thus, what is going to occur in the pages ahead is reflective of the words of Ezekiel chapter 36, which I cite quite often during Prophecy Updates. When they came to the nation, speaking of Israel, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Verse 17 finishes us today. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. The chapter, those 17 verses long, has gone very quickly. The words of quite a few of the verses are generally easy to follow. They're simple and without a lot of explanation. Such is the case with this final verse. Mordecai felt that the agreement was sufficient and reasonable. From this point, he would pass the information on and trusted things might turn out as they should. Again, it must be stressed that forcing the Lord into the verses of this chapter, which almost every scholar does in every movie you watch about the book of Esther, they always do, that is wholly inappropriate. I've shown you the verses of comparison throughout the Old Testament. The Lord specifically left his name out of this book to show us this. The words of Mordecai and Esther are completely void of any acknowledgement of the Lord at all, as are the words of the author who could have supplied them. This often happens elsewhere, such as, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. The author notes what is occurring inside of David's mind for our benefit. Such is not the case here. For this reason, the book of Esther is one which highlights and even magnifies the work of the Lord in a very unique way. He is there, faithfully tending to his people, while they are as faithfully unfaithful as ever. As I said in the last sermon, Mordecai is representative of the Jewish people, but he is also a type of Christ. Just as Christ is concealed in the Old Testament, Mordecai had concealed his national identity. However, Mordecai eventually revealed his national ties, just as Jesus came and walked among his people. In this story, Mordecai and Esther are relying on their Jewishness, not the Lord, to save them. Jesus, as a Jew and who is the Lord, came to save his people. We are seeing types and shadows to help us understand God's unfolding plan of redemption. I see Bob over there. His eyes keep lifting up. He's thinking on this. He always does. He's, he's got these pictures, and he's trying to figure out what I've been trying to figure out as well. Anyway, where was I? When we come to stories like Esther, we know without a doubt that the Lord is there, and yet he is unseen. Unless you were told about the acrostics of his name interspersed throughout the story, you would still know that he is there. It is as obvious as the nose on one's face. But in order to actually find him, he needs to be searched out. This is the lesson we should glean from what we have seen and what we will continue to see. But that lesson isn't just for, ooh, let's look for secrets in the Bible that will show us the Lord. Instead, it is a lesson for our daily lives. His care is evident with every step that we take, every meal that we eat, every flower that we smell, we just have to stop and look for his hand in these things. This week, don't rush through life in such a hurry that you miss the Lord who is right there with you. Instead, take time to talk to him, think about his care, trust in his provision, and know that he is there. This is what the Bible wants us to do. It's exactly what Bob said at the beginning of the service today, all about our lives we have a commitment in this life to do whatever we're going to do, and at the end of it, we're going to be judged. That's just the way it is, and he is right there. I said this in the Bible class on Thursday night. 
We don't see the air in between us. I see Linda right now. I see Bob. I like Linda better. Anyway, I'm kidding. Anyway, we, we don't see the air in between us. But it's there. We're breathing it. It's sustaining us. God is right here. He is omnipresent. That means that God is everywhere at all times. There's no time that he isn't. There's no place that he isn't. And so when we demonstrate faith, we do it by things like talking to him. People might think we're crazy walking down the road talking to ourselves because we're not. We're talking to God. That's what I do every day when I'm working. I go, oh, God, you know, thank you for that. I find a $20 bill in the garbage. I'm always happy. Thank you, Lord. First thing that comes out of my mouth, even a penny. They know we, we have penny. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's it, respect him. Respect the Lord. He's there with us. If you believe that enough, then everything you should do should be in his presence. Everything you think, everything you do. That's the lesson that we're to get from this book of Esther so far in chapter 4. And we're going to continue to, to, to develop the theme and things are going to come out. And at the end, we'll probably, I'm not going to guarantee you this, but we'll probably find out who they are in type and picture. Okay? There, isn't that odd, though, that it goes from he, 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 and all of a sudden it says, then they? I mean, it's the kind of thing you just read over and you never notice. But when you read every single word, one at a time, little things come out that suddenly clue you that God is trying to tell us something about a picture of something else. Wonderful stuff. Best day oh, ever. Best day of my life. Okay, so here's what we got. We got Jesus, who this is what this book is about. And we've got people that may not know Jesus that are watching the sermon right now or that maybe we'll watch it later. And so I have to do as I do every single week. I have to tell you that the Lord is evident. I've already said that to you. He's evident. Even though he's not in the book, we know that he's there. It's hidden in acrostics. The Lord's showing us hints of this. But unless he's the Lord of our life, it doesn't do us any good at all. It does us absolutely no good at all. We can't rely on our person. You know, the Jews rely on being Jewish. We rely on whether we're handsome or got a lot of money or whatever we rely on, big muscles. All those things can disappear. In the end, there is one thing that is absolutely guaranteed. They say death and taxes. Well, that overestimates the people to uh, their ability to cheat taxes. There's one thing that we all must do, and that is die. I had a friend die last night, right? That's just the way it is. And it's one of those things that three weeks ago, he called me. And then he said, Charlie, I'm having a uh, surgery tomorrow. And he treated like he was getting uh, something chopped off of his nose. And I said, okay. And I thought, I'll see how he is in a day or two. And I called, and he's in the hospital still. And don't go to see him today. The, the operation didn't go well, and, and things went bad. So wait till tomorrow. And I went there the next day, and the wife was there. He was in ICU. He was totally unresponsive, and he just never came out of that again. The last time I ever talked to him was like, okay, see you tomorrow, you know? That was my last time to say goodbye to him. And we're all going to face that. And then after that, he's up there meeting the Lord right now. Fortunately, he knew the Lord, and his wife does too, so she's got a place of comfort. But if you don't know him, you're going to meet him on a completely different level than those who do. Call on Jesus Christ to be saved by his shed blood, because that's why he came, was to give his life in exchange for your sins. And then from there, you will be able to meet him on a happy level, not in an unhappy one. There will be rewards and there will be losses, but in the end, the rewards will be infinitely more than the losses for the very fact that we will see the face of the Lord and we will be with him forever. So please, if you've never called on Jesus, let today be the day. And as I said, I'll re read it to you again. Take the time to talk to him, think about his care, trust in his provision, and know that he is there. Our closing verse comes from Isaiah 55. It's verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Well, guess what? He's right there, folks. Call on him. Next week is Esther 5, verses 1 through 14, another whole chapter. Will he be an executor or will he be an acceptor? It's entitled The Golden Scepter. That'll be your seventh Esther sermon. And if you know what the golden scepter means, if you didn't sleep through that part of the sermon, you already know what's going to happen. Good, good job. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. At times, you might feel as if he has no great design for you in life. But he has brought you to this moment to reveal his glory in and through you. Now you know where I got that, I, the thing I say at the end of every Esther, uh, every Esther sermon. It comes from the verse that we read today. You know, there are a couple verses that I've always thought I want to preach on that someday. The naming of Israel. I am that I am. This verse right here. Who knows if you came 
to such a time as this. I know I misquoted that just now, but that's one of the things I've always said. It'd be wonderful to preach on that, and I got to today. <laughs> anyway, follow him and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? Short poem, we'll be done. Unseen and unacknowledged. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes by and by and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, so we read, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. No one could do such a deed. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes, such mourning they did choose. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. And then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take away his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. He refused to be so dressed. Then Esther called Hattak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was for sure. So Hattak went out to Mordecai, Esther's words to state, in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews, these things to him he did relay. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, so crazy and insane, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and to her it explain, and that he might command her to go into the king to make to him supplication and plead before him for the people, yes, to plead for her sentenced nation. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai he told to her. Then Esther spoke to Hathak, giving a reply and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, cutting that life short, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live and not die. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days, and I know not why. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to Esther with his views, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. This point do not miss. But you and your father's house will perish, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day, and then with your plan, I will proceed on. My maids and I will fast likewise, in which is against the law, so I will go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and told to all that Esther commanded him, so he did this thing. Lord God, Thank you for your presence that is with us, even when we don't realize that you are there. Because you sent your own son, Jesus, we can know that you truly do care. And so, Lord, be real to us in a wonderful new way. Open our minds and our hearts to seeing you always through every step we take and throughout every day. Be real to us, O God, and to you we shall give all of our praise. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we certainly thank you for this wonderful book, which continues to open up to us a little bit at a time. And I know that I'm in anticipation of the final sermon. I want to know what's going to happen, too. And so just if you uh, keep us here, if the rapture doesn't happen until then, that'll be wonderful. If it happens before, that'll be even better. But, Lord, there are people that we, uh, we want to pray for. We've uh, mentioned them at the beginning of the sermon, and we would lift them up to you now. We would pray for uh, Chris's son and that he would get over his mono, and we pray for Lisa's son, who's probably now out of surgery, that he will recover well. And we certainly also pray for um, Alan, his, uh, Alan's wife, that is. Alan's already with you, but we pray for his wife, and we pray for all those that are mourning his loss today. We ask that they be comforted. And Lord, we thank you for his life and that he knew you and that uh, despite any failings or whatever in his life, he is redeemed, just like all of us. We've all let you down in some way or another, and yet your grace and your mercy extend beyond that. So we thank you for that, that reassurance that we have. And Lord, we commit the Lord's table to you. We thank you for what it signifies in our lives, and we exalt you and we praise you, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.
We get the instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from the Bible. There Paul wrote for us these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, whoops, for, <laughs> hang on a sec, forgot that, didn't I? For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he would have given thanks over it. He would have said, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper. And he would have blessed it with these words, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei Pari Hagafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Best day of my life. Best day of my life. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh. <laughs> I was just going to say that. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Lord God, we thank you. Thank you again for this wonderful, marvelous treasure called the Holy Bible. We thank you that it is there to direct us to you, to instruct us about you, and how to conduct our lives. And I would pray that each person here would be willing to apply its principles to their lives but they can't do that if they don't know what it says. And so I would pray that each person, whether here or that listens in the future, would say, I'm going to read this word, and I'm going to read it every day of my life, and I'm going to study it, and I'm going to apply it, and I'm going to live it, because we're going to be facing you. 
and it's going to be based on what happens in this word concerning our lives. So we thank you for this gift that you've given us that sets that sure path for us if we choose it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.